featuring casting crowns. And Kane. Summer Concert Series at Cornerstone Church. Visit sacornerstone.org for the full lineup and plan your summer of worship and fun at Cornerstone Church. What's up, everybody? I'm Darius Daniels, man, and I'm coming to San Antonio. I'm so excited to be with Cornerstone Church for their Come Alive event 2024. Listen, this is April 26th through April the 28th. It's going to be a transformative weekend. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to be there. So many others are going to be there. Jesus is going to be there. We need to see you there. It's time to come alive. Cornerstone Church welcomes Grammy nominee Ann Wilson for a free concert Sunday, May 19th at 6.30 p.m. One of Nashville's inspiring new talents, Ann fuses Christian with country music in a way that's thrilled audiences around the world. Catch this rising star as she performs a free concert at Cornerstone Church. Invite your friends for Ann Wilson Sunday, May 19th. For more information, visit sacornerstone.org. On October 7th, nearly 1,000 Palestinian terrorists swarmed Israel's southern border communities and committed unspeakable atrocities. It was the deadliest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. We cannot stand by and tolerate this. The people of Israel are fighting to protect their loved ones and their ancient homelands. We must stand by Israel's side. Join me in our nation's capital for the Christians United for Israel annual summit on July 28th through the 30th as Christians from across the country stand up and speak out on Capitol Hill in support of Israel. Together we can show the Jewish people that they are not alone. Men, are you looking for a place to connect, grow, and enjoy the great outdoors? Our men's ministry is the perfect community for you. We offer a variety of fellowship opportunities that cater to your interests and hobbies. Whether you enjoy sports, fishing, golf, hunting, or classic cars, or you're looking for a meaningful connection, we have something for everyone. But it's not all about the sports and events. Our men's ministry is a place where you can deepen your faith, build lasting friendships. It's a community where we support each other and grow together both spiritually and personally. Come be a part of the men's ministry here at Cornerstone Church, a place of fellowship and adventure. Visit us online at sacornerstone.org slash men for more information.
Good morning, Cornerstone. Would you stand to your feet? Put your hands together as we rejoice in the Lord this morning. Declare with me, there's a praise in this house. When there's a praise in the temple, there's a praise in the house. We can welcome in the Spirit. We can push the devil out. God will open up a window and the blessing will pour out. When there's a praise in the temple, there's a praise in the house. Sing that again. When there's a praise in the temple, there's a praise in the house. We can welcome in the Spirit. We can move the devil out. God will open up a window and the blessing will pour out. When there's a praise in the temple, there's a praise in the house. Sing this with me. It's time to praise. It's time to praise. Enter in with thanksgiving. Enter in with a shout. It's time to praise. It's time to praise. So get up. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. For in the house of the Lord there is praise, there is power, there's anointing. The Holy Spirit abides. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, with great joy have we come to the house of the Lord today to give you highest praise and honor for who you are and for the things that you have made possible in our lives. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been forgiven of all of our sins. We have been made holy because of God's gift to us through Jesus Christ. Today we have healing in the authority of his name. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered and let the word of God go forth from this house today to those who are watching across America and around the world. In Jesus' name we do these things and all of God's children said amen. Give the Lord praise in the house. We thank those of you who are here today for coming this morning. And those of you who are watching television across America, we welcome you to Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas. Today, my son, Pastor Matt, is preaching his third sermon on antidepressants. You want to hear this message because these three sermons that he has been preaching are good for today, tomorrow, and forever because it's the Word of God. Congregation, will you welcome please our national and international radio television ministry as our singers come.
peace and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. nothing worth more oh and there's nothing worth more that could ever come close nothing can compare you're our living hope only in your presence your presence Lord I've tasted and seen oh of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is under Then 
is my beautiful wife, Kelly, and our amazing children, Ariella, Jace, and Eliana. And we'd like to welcome you to Cornerstone Church. We have so many amazing opportunities for everyone in your family to worship, fellowship, and get inspired. Now let's take a look at some of the events we have on our calendar. Come Alive starts this Friday. Enjoy a fun-filled Texas-style weekend of fellowship, food, and life-changing ministry with Pastor Matt Hagee, Pastor John Hagee, Dr. Darius Daniels, Kelly Shackelford, and recording artist, Britt Nicole. Admission is free. Register for the barbecue meal, baptism, and more at sacornerstone.org slash come alive. Looking for an alternative to the public school system? We invite you to join us at Cornerstone Christian Schools. At this interactive admissions event, learn how CCS partners with your student. Enjoy a cup of coffee and take part in a Q&A. RSVP at sa-ccs.org slash coffee and discover how our Christ-centered curriculum will prepare your child for a bright future. We the Kingdom and Katie Nicole are in concert on Friday, May 3rd here at Cornerstone Church and tickets are still available. Use the code CHURCH at checkout for a special discount and get ready to experience a powerful night of worship. Join the Embraced Women's Ministry for our first candle making workshop at Pinspiration. Create a unique candle in a private VIP room. Bring your go-to snacks as we craft a delicious charcuterie board to enjoy. Secure your spot at sacornerstone.org slash embraced. Register now for the final course of our men's spring golf tournament at Silverhorn Golf Club on May 16th. Don't miss the final opportunity to etch your name on the championship trophy. Sign up at sacornerstone.org slash men to secure your spot in the finale. Thank you for joining us in the house of the Lord today. To find out more about our services and all the events we've shared today, please visit us online and make sure to follow us on social media. We pray you have a blessed week. Good morning and God bless you. Those of you who are joining us here in San Antonio at our Cornerstone campus and those of you who are joining and watching online, we welcome you to the house of the Lord today. 
to this morning, we have 97. We went from 95 to 97, three more, and we're over 100. But there's 97 nations and all 50 states that are watching. Uh, Art is watching this morning on YouTube from the Amazon near Venezuela, where he's serving as a missionary. He says, good morning, Cornerstone. Congregation, would you welcome Art and everyone else who's joining us today? It's an honor to have you with us. As you saw in our announcements, a number of things are taking place here at Cornerstone in every area of ministry, but I want you to be a part of the evening service tonight at 6.30 as we continue the sermon series, The Church That Prays. Also, this weekend, we're going to have a very special time here at Cornerstone. This is our Come Alive weekend. The theme is Take America Back. Take America back to the righteous roots and foundations that we were built upon because we need God's outpouring in this nation like never before. Our guests are going to include Dr. Darius Daniels. How many of you have not heard Dr. Darius Daniels speak? Let me see your hand. All right. What I want you to know is he wouldn't be here if he wasn't fabulous. So you owe it to yourself to come hear this dynamic speaker share the principles and the truths of God's word. And I encourage you to be here on Friday evening. Saturday, Kelly Shackelford is going to be one of our guest speakers. I'll be bringing a message Saturday afternoon, Pastor Hagee Sunday morning. And Britt Nicole is going to have a worship concert on Sunday night to finish off the conference, but I want you to write the dates down, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and come and be a part of this Come Alive conference. I know it'll be a blessing to you. Uh, Dad, last week you asked us for prayer because you were gonna go to Washington and strive with other leaders to get our national Congress and, and leadership motivated to help Israel. How did your week go? First, I'd like to thank every member here for your prayers. Uh, because prayer changes things. Amen. Uh, the Bible says what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And uh, we have had a miracle that happened last week when I called for the leadership of Christians United for Israel for an emergency fly into Washington, D.C., a flying means you drop what you're doing, get on a plane, and show up in Washington within a 24 to 36 hour frame of time uh, to contact the members of Congress to pass a bill that would be funding Israel in the war effort against Iran. Now Hamas and Hezbollah are the two armies of Iran, so uh, Iran is fundamentally the head of the snake, so to speak. Uh, miracle number one, when I call for our leaders across America, the Christians United for Israel leaders, over 250 dropped what they were doing and came straight to Washington, D.C. And those of you who are listening, I bless you for your sacrifice because I know that many of you have very important jobs and I thank you for that. Miracle number two, we were received by every member of the U.S. Congress that we went to see. Uh, speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, was the keynote speaker for our membership rally. Uh, speaker Johnson was and is a man under fire. But let me say this about him. I have met him. I have talked with him. He is a dedicated Christian. He is a bold, brilliant, courageous leader. He made the statement there. It has been carried now in the media. Believers have a Bible admonition to stand with Israel. He is one of us. Miracle number three is for the first time in the history of the United States of America, when this bill came to vote that was uh, going to bless Israel, the Democratic Party joined the Republican Party in voting to pass this bill. That has never happened 
in the history of the United States of America that has never happened. But on this issue, it did happen. And it did happen because of your prayers and Israel was involved. Next Sunday, I'm going to be talking about the power of two. The power that two people have when they pray together according to the will and the word of God. I want you to hear that sermon because it's certainly the, the, wash, the, the Washington demonstration of God's power was something we will never forget. God bless you and thank you. The way that we're able to accomplish ministry, the way that we're able to fulfill the mission of this ministry, bringing all of the tithes into the storehouse is what the Bible says, that there may be sufficiency in God's house. So this morning, we're going to receive an offering. And those of you who are here, I'm going to ask our ushers to help us worship the Lord by giving today. I also want those of you who are watching to know that you too can participate by going to sacornerstone.org forward slash give. Or text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 210-880-2300. You can call us at 855-694-9653 or write to us at P.O. Box 34930, San Antonio, Texas, 78265. Pastor, would you pray for today's offering? Can we lift our hands to the throne of grace? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, look from the balconies of heaven into this sanctuary and to those who are now praying with us across America and around the world. Open the windows of heaven and pour out your showers of blessing because it is the goodwill of the Father to bless his children. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of presenting the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to this nation in our greatest moral crisis we have had since the founding fathers landed at Plymouth Rock. I ask you for an outpouring of righteousness to turn back the tide of evil that's sweeping this nation. And that can only be accomplished through the preaching and proclamation of the word of God. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered now. In Jesus' name, amen.
on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over My story's just begun Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does If failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Lay your burdens down Ooh Here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh You're in the Father's house not the end game the journey's where you are you never wanted perfect you just wanted my heart and the story isn't over if the story isn't good the failure's never final when the father's in the room the failure's never final when the father's in the room Lay your burdens down Ooh Here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore the sun to rise and brings the earth new life in every being Jesus it is you and who turns the day to night and watches me as I begin to dream Jesus it is you who brings me food for my table and who cares for all of my needs 
and who walks the road with me has grown with me through all that I have been Jesus it is you my Jesus it is you so I lift my
17 million adults in the United States suffer from depression or related illness. The cause of depression is an area of deficiency and lack in your life. Any place where you do not have the minimum requirement to thrive is where you feel depressed. depressed. The Word of God has been given to you so that my joy will fill up every place of lack and your joy will be full. A promise of redemption, renewal, and abundant life. Like a tree that bears fruit in due season, the fruits of the Spirit help us navigate through life's ups and downs with grace and wisdom. Lift your hands and you say, God, I thank you. I thank you that you've never failed me before and you're not gonna fail me now. You're never disconnected from His grace because where sin did abound, grace did that much more abound. You're never disconnected from His mercy because His mercies are renewed every morning. Don't let the world that we live in steal the joy of the Lord that's inside you. But remember what Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. If you would please stand for the reading of God's Word, and if you brought your Bibles, turn them to John, the 15th chapter, beginning at the 7th verse. As this morning we conclude this sermon series on antidepressants with this message, outgrowing Depression. In the book of Luke, the 24th chapter, the 45th verse, there's an interesting statement that the writer makes. It's a conversation that's happening between Jesus and his disciples. Christ has been crucified. Christ has risen from the dead. And in Luke 24 and 45, it says, and Christ, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. What Christ did for the disciples in that moment is he opened their spiritual eyes so that they could see what heaven wanted them to know from heaven's point of view. How many of you realize that there is your point of view and there's God's point of view? And one of the greatest problems that we have with Scripture is when we try to interpret what He wants from our perspective. It's like taking a key and putting it in a lock, and while it may fit in the lock, it doesn't quite line up just enough to turn it. Have you ever done that? And you get angry because you're sitting there going, I know this is the right key, and you fidget and you twist and you turn, but nothing ever happens, and then you take that key out and you put the right one in, and just like that, it opens up. Well, when you see Scripture from heaven's point of view, what you might have thought actually gets replaced by something that unlocks the door. And my prayer for you today is that you would open up your heart to receive a word that unlocks the principles of truth that enable you to understand that you don't have to live under the weight of depression anymore. For three weeks, we've been talking about something that based on contemporary research impacts about 60 to 70% of the people in this room. But it has nothing to do with how Christ intended for you to live. If he came that you might have life more abundantly, then there is not one place that depression should exist in your life. And my prayer today is not that you get to hear the word, because I'll make sure that happens. But that like the disciples, you have your eyes opened to understanding that you might comprehend what the scripture says. It's one thing to be around it. It's another thing to have it in you so that it can grow and produce what God wants. Today we conclude this sermon series with this message, Outgrowing Depression. Read with me John chapter, seven, John chapter 15, beginning at verse 7. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire 
and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Heavenly Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit that's in this place open our understanding, our heart, soul, and mind to receive the powerful principles of your truth because it will drive out every ounce of sorrow. It will lift every burden. It will destroy every yoke. And it will give us the confidence to know that if God is for us, nothing can stand against us. Lord, your joy is not something that the world gives and is nothing that the world can take away. Your peace surpasses all understanding. Your provision is more than enough because you are a God of all sufficiency. So let your power and your presence open up our hearts to receive this revelation of truth today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So for the past two weeks, we've been talking about antidepressants, and the truth is I've been teaching on the fruits of the Spirit. And the reason that we haven't called it the fruits of the Spirit is because if I were to say the fruits of the Spirit, each of you in your own way would interpret what that means, and some who've been in church all of their lives would say, oh, I've already got that figured out. And some who have not been in church very much would go, well, I really don't understand what that means. But if we talk about anti-depression, everybody has a clue where we're going. And so we've kind of camouflaged this topic with something that was being taught by Paul in the New Testament, not just to the church in Galatia, where we find the scriptures, but he was actually teaching this in every church, in every letter, because he was echoing what Christ was saying in John chapter 15, which was love one another. Say that with me. Love one another. Now, the thing about the love that Christ commanded us to have, and I say commanded us because it says, this is my commandment. This was his law. He said, you love one another like I loved you. And that's a different kind of love. Because the love that we typically love each other with is transactional. It means that I will love you and you will love me as long as we've got a fair trade. I love my boss. Oh, really? If he skipped next payday, would you still love him? I love my in-laws from a distance. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll get to that in a minute. But when Jesus says, you love them like I loved you, what he is saying is you love them expecting nothing in return. And brother, that's a different kind of love. That's the kind of love that you can't do it without Jesus. That's why Jesus in John chapter 15 and verse 5, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And if there's anything that you should remind yourself of on a regular basis, it's that. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. Why? Because whether you want to admit it or not, deep down on the inside of each and every one of us is this selfish little spoiled brat that wants to tell the world, I can do it all by myself. How many of you remember your toddler years? How many of you remember your children's toddler years? And that little fit that they would throw, no, I do it. All right, have it your way. 
Well, each and every one of us have that same self-centered, prideful little screaming kid down inside of us that wants to tell the world, I can do God's thing in my strength. I can do God's will my way. You can't. You can't live for Christ. You can't serve his kingdom on your own terms. You can't do anything without him. Businessman, whether you believe it or not, you can't run your business without Jesus. You want to fix your marriage? You can't fix it with your work. You have to fix it with his will. You want to gain wealth? You can't do that on your own. Why? Because the Bible says all of the gold and all of the silver already belongs to him. You want to raise your children? Good luck. They're going to be teenagers someday. And the reason you're going to have trouble with that is because they're going to act like you. Most people want to try and solve the world's problems. They want to be the general manager of the universe. They want to tell everybody else what they should do. I know what you should do. I know what I'd have done. And all of those things come out of their mouth. Why? Because there's some little arrogant individual on the inside that says, I can do this all by myself. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't live and move and have your being without him. Everything that's in your life, you have to do with him in order for it to last. If anything in your life is going to flourish, if anything in your life is going to thrive, if anything in your life is going to grow, it has to be planted in him. Because if it's not planted in him, it's going to wear you out. It's going to burn you down. It's not going to build you up. It's going to bring you backwards. And Jesus said it very clearly, I have come that you might have life more abundantly. Now, everything that you want to grow in this life, you have to plant it in God's grace, and you've got to grow it in faith. I'll say that again. You've got to plant it in God's grace, and you've got to grow it in faith. Why are these two things involved and why are they different? One, God's grace is his gift to you. You did nothing to deserve it. And faith is your work and your effort and your will to work in his word. They have to go together. Ephesians 2 and 8, it says, by grace you have been saved. That's God's gift. Through faith. That's your obedience to what he has given. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, It is the gift of God that no man can boast. Your salvation is planted in God's grace and it's grown in your faith. Your marriage, if it's going to work, you've got to plant it in God's grace because the Bible says unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Your business, you've got to plant it in God's grace. Why? Because God's got a good word for your business. He said if you put him first, whatever you do, it will prosper. Your children, if you want them to serve the Lord and walk in his path, you've got to plant them in God's grace. Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. You can't do it on your own. You've got to do it in his power and in his might. The point is, no matter what you're trying to accomplish, you have to plant it in God's grace. You have to grow it with your faith, and it will produce the abundance that God's word promises. If you don't, if you do it in your strength, if you do it in your will, it will drain you, it will leave you depleted, you will lack, and any place there's lack, you find depression. This is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, do not be deceived, God isn't mocked, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And then he starts talking about two things that are very present in both of us, in all of us. He says, if you sow from the flesh or you sow from the spirit, when you sow from the flesh, you reap corruption. You reap things that will tear you down. When you sow from the spirit, you reap everlasting life, things that will build you up. Jesus here in John chapter 15, he's telling his disciples 
that they can have their prayers answered. If anybody in this house wants their prayers answered, say amen. Amen. He said that you can abide in his love. If you want to abide in his love, say amen. Amen. And then he says that your joy will be full. If you want your joy to be full, say amen. Amen. He said it's easy. You can grow to that, but in order to grow to that, you've got to love one another. How many of you want to love one another? Amen. Could you define another? I mean, point them out, please. Why is it that we have so much trouble with this? Because we're trying to do God's thing our way. We say, Lord, you want me to love one another? No problem, I got that. And by the time we get in the parking lot, we forgot the promise we made in the pew. Because what we think of as love and what he defines as love is two totally different worlds. We take our perspective and we try to unlock the key to love. We can't even get it to turn. And in doing so, we deceive ourselves. If we're going to love one another, we've got to plant our life in Jesus Christ. So that the fruit that he wants us to produce can grow. And we've got to be planted in his grace. And we've got to apply our faith. Because faith without works is what? Dead. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. What you need to know is that it's at the cross where we get planted into Jesus Christ. It's at the cross where our lives are pulled into, grafted into every covenant that's found in the Bible. This is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ by whom I was crucified and the world was crucified to me. He realizes that none of us are anything without the cross. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How did we get Jesus? We got Jesus at the cross. How did we become new creatures? At the cross. Where did God demonstrate his love and shed it abroad in our hearts? At the cross. At the cross is where we are planted by God's grace. And whenever we get planted, roots have to begin to grow. And since Jesus Christ loved us as we ought to love one another, his love in our lives is what grows the roots that help us grow in our life. Now, if you want to know his kind of love, that self-sacrificing, expecting nothing in return love, you need to go look at 1 Corinthians 13. And there's enough in that one passage to sit and teach for weeks on end. But we're familiar with this passage because we read it all the time at weddings as we lie to each other. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. Love is not proud. It's not self-seeking. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in sin. It celebrates truth. It endures and it believes and it hopes all things. Love never fails. And here's the truth. Until you love like that, you don't really love. Until you love like that, all you're in is a transactional relationship. Love is patient. That's really a bad interpretation. Because what the word means is long-suffering. There's a lot of people who want to remind you how patient they are. You better thank me. I'm being patient with you. Woo! Don't test my patience. When you react like that, you're not being patient. You're just using patience to deliver a veiled threat. 
Whenever it says love is long-suffering, what it means is that the individual who is suffering is enduring the imperfection of others so patiently that you don't know their suffering. And we have to look to Jesus to see this example. Why? Because he was the perfect son of God. He knew everything. He could do anything. And he had to suffer while his father, Joseph, was teaching him how to use a hammer. Jesus would be like, look, dude, you ever heard of a jackhammer? Let me show you something. <laughs> he had to suffer with the disciples when he would teach them the word of God. And they would look at him and say, we don't understand. He had to suffer through all of the imperfections of our lives as he patiently waited on us to understand how much he loved us and gave himself for us. And yet while he was patient with us, his mercy was still renewed every morning. His loving kindness never fell short. His grace was sufficient. Thank God that he was willing to suffer long on our behalf and do all that he could to patiently wait for us to become who he believed and knew we could be. Love is patient. Let's go back and look at some of those roots. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Kindness is the desire to help others, not harm them. And here's the truth about kindness. You really can't identify it in the moment. Because sometimes people will be kind to you, and the truth is they're trying to harm you. And then there's other times that people sound like they might be harmful, but the truth is they're being kind. Because kindness is not in what you say. Kindness is in the outcome that's produced. Kindness is the intent to help and not to harm. Proverbs 27 and 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Friends are kind. And if friends say something that offends you, they're saying it because they're trying to help you, not to harm you. Proverbs 26, 7 and 6 also says, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Now, from our perspective, we would probably always choose the kiss. I want the person that kisses me. But from God's perspective, what's the outcome? Are they helping you? Are they harming you? Kindness is willing to speak the truth in love. That's what Ephesians 4 and 15 says. It says, speak the truth in love. Why? That you may grow in all things into him who is the head, which is Christ. How do you grow? You speak the truth in love. Where does truth come from? Truth comes from God's word. You may have your opinion and I may have my opinion, but truth is getting God's opinion on the matter. Now, here's the thing about truth. It's not always pretty. It's not always easy. It's not always comfortable. How many of you know sometimes truth hurts? Those of you who don't, just go look in a mirror. It'll, it, it'll tell you the truth every time. But when you speak the truth in love, you deliver it with kindness, and you receive the benefits from it, and it helps to heal and to grow. One of the problems that we have in the church today is that we don't want to speak the truth in love. We just want to pretend like we're being kind. Let me tell you something. If you have a confrontation with God's word and it does not offend you enough to change, you're not reading it right. Love does not envy. That means that love celebrates the success of others. Love does not hear about someone's promotion and go, why was it him and not me? It's thrilled to see God's blessings poured out in somebody else's life. Love does not parade itself. Love does not play that anything you've done, I've done better. Have you ever listened to one of those conversations where somebody is sharing something? You go, oh, well, that's nothing. Let me tell you about that one time. And they just spend 45 minutes one-upping each other. That's parading yourself. 
Love is not puffed up. What does puffed up mean? It means that nobody ever believes when they truly love like Christ loved that you're too good to be around other people. Love is not a snob. Love is not rude. That means it's delivered with gentleness. It's not disruptive. Love does not seek its own. That means it's giving of itself. Love is not provoked. That means that love is not overly sensitive. You ever met people that are so hypersensitive that if you don't do the right thing at the right time in the right way, you have offended them for a month? And the thing about doing the right thing at the right time in the right way is that they don't even know what the right thing at the right time in the right way is. They're just looking for a reason to be mad at you. One time you smile at them and they're like, what'd that smile mean? And so the next time you don't smile at all and they go, well, you don't ever talk to me. And so you sit down and talk to them and you go, well, you're just wearing me out. I'm not talking about you, but does anybody know somebody who's like that? The truth is that's not love, that's selfishness. Jesus is not so provoked that if you don't do the right thing at the right way, he constantly pounds it into your being. He says, I've got thick enough skin, I can endure your inconsistency. This is why Paul said, even when we're not faithful, he remains faithful. This is a big one right here. Love thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in sin. Say that with me. Love thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in sin. In sin. Why is that a big thing? Because one of the problems that we have in the body of Christ today is we cannot wait to hear some juicy morsel of iniquity gossip about somebody else in the church. Don't you dare say you love me and go look for dirt on me. Don't you dare say you love somebody else and when you hear about some fallen state in their being, you go, ha, 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 I told you. Called that one. This kind of love that we're reading about is the kind of love that Jesus loved us with. And let me tell you something. There's nothing that you're going to reveal to him. He already knows it all. And in knowing all of the dirty laundry that's in your basket, he doesn't rejoice in any iniquity. He only sees and he hopes for the good. Love bears all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. That means that it's strong enough to last. Now here's the thing. Of all of these descriptions of love, Paul is very clear that if you do not have love, you are nothing. Nothing. He said, you can be as smart as anybody who's ever been. And if you don't have love, you're nothing. And you can be as gifted as anyone who's ever walked. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. Whenever you read these verses, love is, take love out and put your name in. Matt is patient. Matt is kind. Matt is not provoked. (laughs) How many of you think we got work to do? You can't do it without Jesus. You can't do it without his help. And the thing about this fruit is it takes time. It takes effort. In 2020, I planted four peach trees. I'm so excited that 2024, I'm finally going to get a peach. (laughs) My respect for those guys up in Fredericksburg has gone off the charts. (laughs) Four years I don't even care if it's a good peach. I'm going to eat it. (laughs) 
But what we do because we want everything so instantaneously is we say, okay, Jesus, I accept you. I plant myself in your grace. I read the Bible. I pray my prayers. Now, where's the roots and where's the fruit? Fruit takes time. It's going to take some time and it's going to take some work to get your old self dead and buried and get your new self growing deep enough that you can begin to show others the love that Christ has showed you. But here's what you need to know. If the root is right, the fruit is right. Matthew 12 and 33, it says, a tree is known by its fruit. You can't have rotten fruit and claim you've got good roots. If what you're doing is causing confusion, division, bringing anxiety into relationships, creating chaos and confusion, you've got a root problem. And this is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You can pretend and you can perform for others, but you can't pull the wool over God's eyes. And so in Galatians chapter 5, the preceding chapter, Paul is giving us this admonition. He says that you need to walk in the Spirit so that you do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Remember, we can't do it on our own. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's how? By His Spirit. But the truth is that's much easier said than done because Galatians 5 and 17 says that there's something on the inside of us, this natural instinct that wants to see our will done, not God's will done. And he describes that the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit is against the flesh, that the flesh wants what it wants and the spirit wants what God wants. Now, how many of you recognize this tug of war in you? If you don't recognize it, it's because the flesh has got you beat. Because Paul, who took a guided tour of heaven, don't know anybody in this room got that one. He said about this flesh and spirit thing, he said, in me, in Paul, in this green beret for God, what I don't want to do, I often do, and what I want to do, I often can't do. Why? Why? Because there's flesh and there's spirit and they're battling each other. People tell me all the time, I've got self-control. Cool, let's sit in front of some chips and guacamole. You have to understand this struggle because if you don't understand this struggle, you won't understand how desperately you need God's help. You'll think in your own strength, I can tell my flesh what to do. No, you can't. It's already got you. Galatians 6, do not be deceived. One of the things that leads to depression is deception. When you tell yourself what you expected and you don't get the result that you expected, suddenly you become depressed. How many young people have I talked to that say, I I thought I'd be farther along by now? Well, guess what? Fruit takes time. I thought I'd be more successful than I am right now. Guess what? Success takes time. I thought I'd have more than I have right now. Guess what? Growth takes time. When you deceive yourself and your expectations aren't met, you begin to get frustrated. When you get frustrated, you start fussing. When you start fussing, you turn to fuming. When you fume, eventually you get fatigued. Anybody know something about frustration, fussing, fuming, and fatigue? And when that happens, what you've got to ask yourself, whose strength am I operating in? Because if I'm operating in God's strength... Isaiah chapter 40 says, they that wait upon the Lord, he'll renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings as eagles. They'll walk and not grow weary. They'll run and not be faint. But if I'm operating in my strength, I don't have enough. Paul is challenging this church in Galatians because they have deceived themselves. And he begins this conversation about their deception in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. 
He says, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. In verse 3, he says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit and now you're trying to be made perfect by the flesh? Now, here's what you need to know. The way that they deceived themselves is that they thought they could do God's thing their way. And what they were trying to do was make up a set of religious rules that was going to make God happy with them. In the modern context, we would call this legalism. They weren't going to plant themselves in God's grace. They were going to plant themselves in their effort, in their strength. And Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And they had allowed themselves to be deceived because they had teachers come in and those teachers said, well, the reason that you don't feel the presence of God is because you're not keeping this long list of rules. This kind of characteristic is what defines most denominations these days. This long list of man-made rules and God says, that's not it at all. You plant yourself in my grace. You grow yourself with your faith. And you're going to live a life that's more abundantly. So instead of being faithful to the Spirit of God, they're deceived. They decided they'd make up their own rules, and by making up their rules, God was going to be blessed by it. God was going to look down and be like, oh, look, they're keeping rules. They're cutting their hair and they're wearing long skirts and they're not wearing makeup. Angels rejoice. (laughs) How stupid is that? But how many places do we find this same kind of thing happening in churches all over the world? And do you know what it leads to? Depression. One of the most depressing things that you'll ever encounter is legalistic religion. It leads to fussing. It leads to fuming. It leads to frustration. It leads to fatigue. Because you can't do it in your own strength. A tree is known by its what? Fruit. You can't fake the fruit. If it's in the root, it's in the fruit. We're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit here in just a minute, but before we do, you need to see some of the things that Paul describes in a different kind of tree. He's talking about the flesh and the Spirit, and then he says the works of the flesh are evident. You can't hide them. The flesh produces the flesh. The Spirit produces the Spirit. And when he starts to talk about the works of the flesh, he's describing something that is barren and broken, and he begins with sexual sins. Let's look at the tree that represents the rotten fruit of the flesh. These are the moral, and these are the sexual sins. He says there's adultery, sex outside of marriage. There's immorality. How many of you see a culture that is saturated in immorality in the world we live in today? There's fornication. Fornication is the Greek word pornea, from where we get the word pornography, which means it's a hidden impurity. It's something that you're keeping within yourself. But then he goes from impurity to uncleanliness. This is whenever you have an outward demonstration of your perversion, which leads to lewdness and vulgarity, which means that you've got such a public and prominent display of how proud you are of your shameful behavior that you start marching down the streets and demanding equal rights because of your choices not because of your character. Anybody see that in the world we're living in? Now, it's real easy for the church crowd to look at all that and go, yeah, I see it. But there's a problem. Paul doesn't stop there. He flips it over and he says, not only are there moral sins, but there's spiritual sins. Let's look at that side of the tree. Uh Uh-oh. There's idolatry. Now, I know a lot of people would say, well, pastor, I don't have any statues that I bow down to, but know anything that you have higher than God is an idol. Some people hold their business as an idol. Some people hold their will as an idol. That's why Samuel said to Saul that stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. 
There's hatred. There's contention. What's contention? Well, I just don't agree with that person. Well, who made you so important? There's jealousy. There's wrath. You ever seen anybody that tries to control somebody with intimidation and anger? God says that's a lust of the flesh. That's you manipulating them. And manipulation is as witchcraft. There's dissension and there's heresies. How often do we find people in church using dissension and false teaching to try and manipulate an outcome their way? God is not mocked. He sees these things and he says, if you reap it, you're going to sow it. If you sow it, you're going to reap it. But then he says, hey, let's go look at the other side of the tree. There's three sides of this tree. There's not just spiritual sins and there's not just moral sins, but there's also social sins. On the other side of that tree... There's envy. That's when you take action against others so that you can possess what they have. Murder. That's not just killing with your bare hands. Jesus said if you have hatred in your heart towards your brother, you've murdered him. Drunkenness, which is excessive consumption of alcohol. And that one's easy to define and see. But let's look at revelries. You know what revelry is? Revelry is anything that you do in indulgence. So maybe you don't drink a whole case of beer, but if you eat a whole bucket of chicken, God says that one's bad too. He said, if you buy a dozen cookies and there ain't nothing but crumbs in a half hour, you got some things we need to talk about. So there's the drink indulgent, there's the food indulgent, but does anybody know somebody who spends excessive amounts of money because it makes them feel better? That's indulgence too. Anybody know somebody who just loves gossip? That's indulgence too. Any place of your life that is out of control, God says that is something that you are doing in your flesh. So before we start disqualifying the lusts of the flesh in our own lives, how many of you recognize that all of these are present in us on a very regular basis? Which is why this struggle is so real. Jesus tells us, you're going to bear fruit. When you love one another. Let's go back and look at this other tree. The tree where the fruit of the Spirit grows. We're planted in the love of Christ. His roots start to grow in our life. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 4. We read at the end of that passage, love never fails. It doesn't fail us. And if we let it grow in us, it will not fail others. And here in Galatians, Paul says the fruit. He didn't say the fruits. He said the fruit of the Spirit. It's grown in love. God's love. Christ's love. And that fruit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. How many of you recognize if it's in the root, it's in the fruit? If it's in the root, it's in the fruit. Now I say this in closing, what you need to understand, fruit is for the picking. This is the hardest part of this conversation. If you've stayed with me till now, I might lose you right here. Fruit is for the picking. Apple trees don't grow apples for themselves. They grow apples so that somebody else can pick them and enjoy them. And one of the reasons why we have so much depression and lack in the church is because a lot of God's kids have a no trespassing sign around their tree. Don't touch me. Don't take from me. But what you need to understand is that your joy is not for you. Your joy is for your brother or sister in Christ that when they're depleted and they're depressed, they can come pick a little joy out of your life and get filled up. And their peace, their love, 
their kindness, their patience, it's not for them. It's so that when you need peace and you need love and you need kindness, you can go to somebody in whom you have fellowship with and you can pick it from them. Now in a healthy church, all of those things occur. But in an unhealthy church, you have more pickers than you have producers. People who just want to take, 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 take and never give, give, give. Here's the good news. Paul said, do not be deceived. God isn't mocked. If all they do is pick and never put back, God will take it up with them. But you just keep producing. That's why the verse that comes after this in Galatians 6 says, do not grow weary while doing good. Because in due season, somebody say in due season, you will reap if you do not lose heart. How is that possible? In my mind, if I give to somebody, they're supposed to give back to me. But in God's mind, if I give to them and I don't expect anything in return, then I have qualified to receive from him what they have taken. This is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart unto the Lord, not to man, knowing that your reward comes from him. How can I joyfully, constantly give without looking at you and saying, you owe me a dozen apples? It's because that's okay, you can have them. They weren't mine to begin with. It wasn't my love. It was his love. It wasn't my joy. It was his joy. It wasn't my peace. It was his peace. It wasn't my gentleness, my kindness, my goodness, my long suffering. All of that came from him. And if you took it from me, all you've done is given him permission to pour out more upon me so that I can continue to give to those who need it around me. This is why Jesus said, my joy will be in you and your joy will be full if you keep my commandment and love one another as I have loved you. Can we stand in the presence of the Lord? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place today and you say, Pastor, I've been doing God's thing my way. I've been trying to accomplish his will with my works. And rather than struggle in my strength any longer, today I want to walk in his love and led by his spirit, feel his joy, his peace, his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness overtake every area of my life. I don't want to be weighed down anymore. I want to walk in joy. I don't want to be depressed with worry anymore. I want to walk in the peace that surpasses all understanding. I don't want to spend one more moment of another day worried and thinking about this world, but I want to rejoice in the God who has overcome the world and given me that victory. If that's you this morning, as a testament to it, would you just simply raise your hand towards heaven? and say, Jesus, that's me. I want everyone in this room to raise their hands and repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for loving me enough that you were patient, that you were kind, that you were willing to give me your grace and your mercy so that I could grow up and be your child. Today I ask that your Holy Spirit lead me and show me how to grow in your love by your grace 
in faith believing that I would be a giver and not a taker. That I would show everyone who needs your love the kind of love that you have shown me. I ask this in Jesus' name because your word has said if I keep this commandment whatever I ask the Father will do it. So thank you for hearing me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Lift your hand for a blessing. And now may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace. May you walk in the love of Christ, one for the other. And thus shall your life be abundantly blessed with all things. Receive this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. being here with us today at Cornerstone Church. I pray that you felt the presence of the Lord no matter where you're watching from and that you heard a word that encourages you to continue to grow in your faith, to plant your life in Jesus Christ by His grace and to see the fruit of the Spirit overcome every area of lack and depression as you recognize that God is for you and not against you, that His word is alive and powerful and can bless you no matter where you are today. I'd want you to stay tuned because we have more content coming your way in our Sunday conversation. I also want to invite you to go look at jhm.org and see how you can connect with this ministry either through prayer or by finding a way to share with others the content that we make available to you all day, every day. For those of you who'd like to give today, you can go online to sacornerstone.org forward slash give or text the word give to 210-880-2300. I want to thank you for being a part of our service. Remember, this weekend is going to be our Come Alive event. Darius Daniels on Friday night, Kelly Shackelford and myself on Saturday, Pastor Hagee on Sunday, Britt Nicole as a worship leader throughout with a great concert on Sunday night. You don't want to miss this special time here at Cornerstone. If you're in the area or you're in driving distance or you want to be a part of this service, don't miss it. Make a plan to be here. It's going to be a great event. I look forward to seeing you again very soon from Cornerstone Church. You're watching Hagee Ministries. Don't go away. Here's more teaching from the Word of God. Welcome back to our Sunday conversation. For the last several weeks, we've been talking and using the illustration from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, about the banqueting table of the bridegroom and how the banner of God's love provides us with everything that we need. Last week, we were talking about the four legs that are on this table, and we're going to continue with that thought today because those four legs create stability in our lives. Leg number one, the Word of God. Nothing in our life works or is maintained or sustained without God's Word. Leg two, we have salvation through Jesus Christ. Leg three, our public profession and water baptism, which is simply living a life of obedience. It's the beginning step in following Christ. What does it mean to be a Christ follower? It means you do what He did. Leg four, the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything that we do is done by His power in our lives. 
So today I want you to look at John chapter 9, verse 31, as we continue to establish these principles and understand how God's promises in our life are brought to us based on our ability to hold those four legs on the table of His grace. John chapter 9 and 31 says this, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, he hears him. How important is it in your life to be heard by God? I know in my life, I want all of my prayers to be heard, but there are times that I feel like I'm praying and it's just bouncing off the ceiling. Nothing is getting through the roof into heavenly places. When that is occurring, I don't ask God why he's not listening. When that's occurring and I feel that in my own life, I have to ask myself, what's wrong that God is not able to hear you? And when I use this particular verse as a diagnostic test, I realize that it's one of two things. There's either unconfessed sin in my life because it says God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper or I'm not approaching God in the right way. I'm not entering into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I'm coming with a complaint. I'm whining, not worshiping. And sometimes that's easier said than done. Or that I haven't done God's will. Here's the three criteria. God doesn't hear sinners. If anyone is a worshiper and does his will. How many times do we hear God give us direction? Do we listen to a message and the pastor says something in the sermon, we go, that was for me. Or we read something in his word and he enters a thought into our mind that we realize isn't our thought. I always know that it's the voice of the Holy Spirit and God in my life when it's really the last thing that I would have thought of or the first thing that I would want to do. When it's contrary to my will, I'm pretty familiar with the fact that it's his will. But how often do we receive those kinds of instructions and we delay? God says, give, and we say, not now. God says, go, and we say, not yet. God says, do, and we say, I'm not ready. We act like that little kid who's going to his swimming lessons and he's standing on the edge of the pool and the instructor is trying to entice him to jump into the water and we are they're giving a list of excuses why we can't swim. Trust me, God knows that you can't swim without his help. He just wants you to have enough faith to jump in. Sometimes we're not doing God's will with the best of intentions when what we should be doing is just simply being obedient. So how are all these thoughts connected? In order to be a worshiper of God, you have to willingly do his will will. That's how you're heard. If you want your prayers to be heard so that you can receive the desire of your heart, not only do you have to be in his presence, but you have to get there in the right way. Consider how the leg of salvation and the word of God uphold this promise. Consider how the power of the Holy Spirit is a part of this and obedience, all four of those legs that we've been talking about. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to worship God without the power of the Holy Spirit because you gotta get your flesh out of the way. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to worship God because you feel like it. It's just going to be an act of your obedience. There's a passage in the Gospel of John, one of my favorites. It's Jesus speaking with the Samaritan woman and he's at the well, and they're discussing worship. Many people think they're talking about water because Jesus begins the conversation with, would you draw me some water? And while the conversation begins with water, it quickly turns to worship because throughout this passage in John chapter four, that's the key word that is constantly being repeated. In John 4, 23 and 24, it says the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in 
truth. Worship is one of the things that's on the table. The power of the Holy Spirit is one of the legs that holds up the table. Here's what Jesus tells the lady in that John chapter four passage. He says, God is spirit and those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Whenever the four legs of God's power are established in your life, his word, salvation, obedience, the power of the Holy Spirit, you have a very balanced and stable life. Have you ever gone into a restaurant and you sit at a table and one of the legs is missing the coaster that holds it in balance? Every time you lean on the table, it tilts. Anything you put on the table has the propensity to roll off. Eventually you get frustrated and you wind up taking a menu and sticking it under the table so that everything will maybe balance out and you won't have such an unstable and uncertain time. Well, oftentimes in our lives, when we feel that kind of instability, when we have that type of inconsistency, it's because one of these legs is out of balance. We're not worshiping God. We're not living that lifestyle that requires us to be obedient. We're not utilizing and standing in the power of his word. We're not being obedient. We're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. But when these four legs are established, you can accomplish what the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter four and verse 16. This is where Paul beautifully describes how we have access to God. He says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. Understand that in the Old Testament, the high priest could only go into the presence of God on a certain day at a certain time and in a certain way. And if he was not properly prepared, properly cleansed and properly living, it would cost him his life. Under those circumstances, I promise you, you would not find a high priest that would go boldly into the presence of God. But here, Paul tells us that we can go boldly into the presence of God, not intimidated, not worried, not concerned about having our life snuffed out for some unrighteous and unconfessed deed. But we can go boldly because of the power of God's word, because of the gift of salvation, because of a life of obedience and because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of Jesus Christ, we can go boldly into God's presence. And what does verse 15 tells us? It tells us that when we get there, we can receive grace and mercy in our hour of need. We will be heard. You come boldly into God's presence because you're in right standing relationship with God the Father. I'm never concerned to go into my dad's office because I know the relationship and the standing that I have with him. And I understand that he'll listen to everything that I'm seeking when I come. Oftentimes you hear people who haven't been to church in a while talk about how well a roof might fall in if I go or you know they, they, they give a litany of excuses and really what all those excuses are is just the camouflage that they have because they're afraid of getting back into God's presence. When you come boldly into the presence of God, you have not only come in a right way, but you are in the most powerful place that you'll ever be, in front of the most powerful force in heaven and in earth. When you come boldly into God's presence, and you know how to ask the Father in Jesus' name, not only will you be heard, but according to God's word, you'll be answered. John chapter 15, verses seven and eight. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, then what you ask the Father in my name, you shall have. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of life that I wanna live that what I ask God the Father in the name of Christ Jesus, I will have. I may not have it on my schedule. 
It may not come in the manner that I thought it would, but as long as God is the one who's doing it, I'll gladly receive it because he knows better than I do. That's the purpose and the power of prayer, to get you into God's presence so that you can experience what Matthew's gospel says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open. And then there's confirmation in that passage. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, to him, it will be open. If you understand the power and the purpose of prayer and how it's connected to a life of obedience and worship, you'll begin to believe what the Bible says, all things are possible. So, based on this, how do we abide in Christ? Jesus said it very clearly, if you abide in me. Now understand something that's very important in that statement. If, if. Whenever you read that word, it means that what's about to happen is a conditional promise. You read if in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is where we hear so many of the blessings that are often repeated and utilized in sermons in so many other ways. I'll make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You'll lend to many and not borrow. You'll be the envy of the nations. Your enemies that come against you will scatter. All of those promises are in Deuteronomy chapter 28, but all of those promises follow the word if. Moses was telling the children of Israel as they were getting ready to go into the promised land, if you abide in the word of God, if you diligently obey his voice, if you keep the commandments, these blessings he'll bring to you. And for the next several verses, all of those blessings are listed. He'll bless you in your going in and your coming out. He'll bless you in your basket and in your bowl. He'll bless you in the fruit of your womb. All of those blessings are there if you obey his word. But then after all of those blessings, there's another if. If you do not obey. If you do not heed my voice. If you do not keep my commandments. And the balance of that chapter is riddled with curses. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall you be in your going in, your coming out, in your body, in your children, in your nation, in your land. There's verses in there that say that God will cause the heavens to become like brass and you will not receive rain. How many places in the world right now do we see drought occurring in such epic proportions that the word historic doesn't even begin to cover it? Based on that evidence, I would propose to you that we're not obeying God's word which is why we're not receiving God's blessings. So when you read this word in John chapter 15, if you abide in me, recognize that the if is always in us and it's never in God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. James actually says there is no shadow or variation of turning in him. He's utilizing the analogy of a sundial. A sundial was something that never changed, but as the sun rotated around it, the shadow that it cast would change, and then you could tell what time of day it was. What he's saying is, is that God never changes. God never has a variation. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's that constant. So when you read the word if, recognize that God is not deciding winners and losers. He's basically saying this is available to anyone who wants it, but in order to receive it, you have to do what I ask. So if you abide in me, how do we abide in Christ? Based on the word of God, heart, soul, mind, and body. This is not only stated in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. You read about the parable of the Good Samaritan, and it begins with a conversation that Jesus has with a young scribe and an attorney who wants to debate the law. He says, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and body, for on 
these two, all of the prophets and all of the law are held. And then Jesus extends it and he says, but love your neighbor as yourself. So in order for us to abide in Christ, it's not just a partial desire. It is a complete surrender. You cannot abide in Christ on Sunday and then live for yourself Monday through Friday. You cannot abide in Christ in your decision to listen to worship music, but not live a life of obedience and giving. You cannot abide in Christ in one area and ignore him in another area. Because by doing this, you want to have equal standing with the Lord and he cannot be Lord if he's equal with you. So let's consider heart, soul, mind, and body. I believe that the most clear sign of the expressions of your heart come out of your mouth. That's what the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Have you ever heard anyone blurt something out and then they say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I wasn't thinking. No, you were thinking. You just didn't have enough time to stop the thoughts that you were thinking before those thoughts were heard. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So how do you abide in Christ with your mouth? Romans chapter 10 and verse nine. If you confess your, with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart, you will be saved. If the heart believes, the mouth confesses. This is true in any dynamic. What the heart believes, the mouth confesses. Ask somebody who's going to win a basketball game. What the heart believes, the mouth confesses. Ask someone if they're having a good day. What the heart believes, the mouth confesses. Ask someone if anything in the world that you want to ask them and what the heart believes, the mouth confesses. So when your mouth is confessing the Lord Jesus Christ, in your heart, that belief exists. Consider abiding in the Lord with your mind. Look at Philippians chapter four and verse eight. Paul is giving those who are reading this letter a prescription. He says, finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good and of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. He's saying, change your focus. Your mental menu is not everything that's wrong in the world, but your mental menu is everything that God is doing to be a blessing in your life. What everything is good, lovely, of good report, meditate on these things. How many times do you hear people in conversation say things like, well, we've solved all the world's problems. And really what they're saying is we've just spent the last bit of time, however long it is, a half hour, an hour and a half complaining, but using our complaints to act like we're really concerned. In the book of Ephesians, the description of people who are spirit-filled is that they encourage each other with psalms and with hymns. What would happen in your life if everyone that you ran into who professed to be a Christian did just that, encouraged you by giving praise to God for something good going in their life? You'd look forward to seeing people instead of run from them. We live for God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our body. When we willingly accomplish what 1 Peter chapter 5 says, cast all of your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. The point is, so many times we hinder our lives from abiding in Christ when we refuse to let go of the things that concern us. That verse in 1 Peter is connected to a description of the enemy. It says that he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then we read, but cast all of your cares upon him for he cares for you. What is the enemy trying to do? He's trying to overwhelm you with care. A roaring lion is not really a dangerous lion because as long as he's roaring, you can hear him, you know where he is. 
A dangerous lion is the one who's prowling in the tall grass that you can't see. And when you walk by unknowingly, he's going to bite you. But a roaring lion wants to intimidate you. A roaring lion wants to create anxiety. A roaring lion wants to create doubt. He wants you to freeze with fear. So when you start counting your cares instead of casting your cares, when you start talking about the direction that you see the world headed, when you start discussing all of the corruption that you see in the government, when you start discussing all of the theories and all of the things that are being talked about all day long on news networks and everywhere else that you can obtain that information, I'm not telling you to ignore the world that's around you, but I'm saying don't count those cares and wonder what in the world is going on. Cast those cares onto the God who has promised us that he has overcome the world. Because by doing so, you liberate yourself to abide in his word, in his truth, stand upon his promises and build a relationship that trust becomes the root of and your work becomes the fruit of. Remember, God expects us to produce fruit. Begin that process by trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, leaning not to your own understanding and casting your care upon Him. I want you to have a great week. We're going to continue discussions on how we can abide in Christ when we come back in our next Sunday conversation. As the world around us seems to take a very dark turn, you might ask yourself, is it possible to prosper in every area of life, even in such perilous times? The answer is yes. Are you trusting Him to lead the way and show you what steps to take next? In Him, you have the ability to prosper, to help you grow in your faith and learn how to trust the Lord through your storms. We want to send you a copy of our inspiring 100-day devotional titled Stormproof and a set of Stormproof magnetic bookmarks. This invaluable resource is our gift to you for your support of any amount. For your generous donation of $150 or more, we'll also send you our Stormproof Journal and a bundle of 100 uplifting scripture postcards aligned with the themes of the Stormproof Devotional. To carry these treasures and more, we're pleased to include our stylish anchored tote bag. When you fill your mind with the Word, the enemy can no longer control you because your mind is set on things not of this world. Call the number on screen or go to jhm.org storm. Hi, I'm Kendall Hagee. Thank you for connecting with us today. God bless you, and we pray that you'll join us again next week.